My name is Brian Feely. I'm the Chief of Sports Medicine and Shoulder Surgery at the University of California, San Francisco. I'd like to talk today about ACL reconstruction. I'm going to go over the basics of ACL injuries and the surgical procedure. And this is primarily for patients and trainees, either junior residents or medical students or people observing in the operating room. I'm going to go over how we evaluate for ACL injuries, what the history is, what the differential diagnosis is, um, what we look for on imaging. I'll talk about how ACL surgery is performed with a surgical video with some intraoperative technical tips. And then finally, I'll go over the rehabilitation and return to play protocols. ACL surgeries and ACL injuries are extremely common. Approximately 200,000 people annually in the United States injure their ACL, and about three quarters of those will proceed to surgery. Most of the time, patients will describe a traumatic event to the knee that they distinguish from other events where they think something considerably bad happened to their knee. This can either be a contact injury, such as you got hit playing soccer or football, or a non-contact injury where you were cutting and pivoting, your foot planted, you tried to change direction and you felt something shift in the knee. The most common one that we see is usually from skiing where your ski gets caught in uneven snow or you hit a bump or landing wrong and you felt something pop and you felt your knee twist. About 70% of people will say they heard a pop or a grinding feel and a majority of people will get swelling within the first three hours. Uh, the pop and the swelling within three hours, I think, is really important because that helps differentiate from other common things that are going to cause swelling in the knee, such as a meniscus or cartilage injury. The other thing I think is important to differentiate with people with a ACL tear is that most of the time an ACL tear is going to keep people from going back to playing the sport that they were just doing. So oftentimes they say they will try to ski down the mountain, but something felt unstable or they stood up, something felt wrong, and they ended up being brought down the mountain in the by ski patrol. Similarly, if they're a soccer player, they'll often feel like they could take a couple steps, but as soon as they started to try to jog, something felt wrong inside their knee. When we see patients with a suspected ACL injury, we obviously examine the entire knee, but the things that we look most specifically for are the Lachman test and the pivot shift test. The Lachman test is the most sensitive for an acute ACL injury, and what that does is that tests the stability of the ACL as we pull the knee forward. So if you look at this drawing that is sitting above my head, this is looking straight on at a knee um, with the femur bent at about 90 degrees. So this is the femur, this is the tibia, and this is the ACL. And you can see it's been removed, but these are the two bundles of the ACL and they go back and attach back into this area. When we do a Lachman test, we hold the femur still in one hand and we pull the tibia forward. And what that does, if you have an ACL injury, is you feel the tibia slide too far forward. The pivot shift is a little bit more complicated of a maneuver, but it tests the rotational stability of the knee, which is important because the ACL is your primary restraint to the rotation of the tibia relative to the femur. So what we do with that test is we put the leg straight and then we, we put a axial load. So we lean into the knee and internally rotate or turn the tibia in. That's gonna pull this part of the tibia forward. And if you have an ACL tear, it'll come a few millimeters too far forward. And as we bend your knee, the tibia will slide back into place. And that is the pivot shift. Almost always we are going to obtain x-rays, both to rule out fractures and also to look at the anatomy of the knee. More and more we understand that there are specific anatomic factors that we can see on x-ray, such as your tibial slope, the width of your notch, which is this part here. Your tibial slope is how far back you slope on the tibia from front to back, as well as other factors, including looking for a fracture to make sure that there isn't another injury we need to be looking out for. The gold standard for imaging after an acute ACL injury is an MRI, and a majority of patients are going to get an M MRI in this setting. Uh, these are representative examples of a patient. We can see that there is swelling, as we see with this white fluid up above uh, the in the suprapatellar pouch. We can see the bone bruise pattern on the femur, 
The reason why this bone bruise happens is that your tibia, which is right here, slides forward and hits here and causes a bone bruise with that subluxation event. On this image, we see an ACL tear. So your ACL should be a black band that sits from this attachment here and runs all the way up into this area here. In this instance, the ACL is torn and the graft fibers are ruptured. A majority of the time, about 90% of the time, an ACL is a complete tear. So patients act often ask, well, is it a partial tear? Is it a complete tear? I think many of the times partial tears we actually don't see in clinic. However, complete tears are ones that you have stability, instability on exam. Almost always the MRI is going to show a complete tear. Well, there are a variety of factors that we talk about for patients, including timing of surgery, fixation options, uh, rehabilitation protocols. Perhaps the most important and controversial is how we are going to reconstruct the ACL. So first of all, it's important to understand that most of the time, if not all the time, we are doing a reconstruction or giving you a new ACL. We are not doing a repair where we are sewing your old ACL together. When we talk about graft choice, there are two choices. There is allograft or cadaver tissue and autograft, which is your own tissue. Uh, the most influential data that I have found um, is from this study by Chris Kading, published in Sports Health almost a decade ago at this point. Um, what they looked at is through a variety of different um, off, um, clinical settings, they looked at retear rates and compared allograft, which is the dark line, and autograft as a function of patient's age. So on the y-axis is the percent risk of failure going from zero to 25%. And on the x-axis is the age of the patient. And you can see particularly under the age of 25, there is a considerably higher failure rate with cadaver tissue. Um, over 35, the failure rates drop below 5% for both, and certainly there is no real significance over the age of 40. So what that means for my patients is that I will usually tell them over the age of 40, allograft is probably the dominant treatment strategy unless you are extremely active in cutting and pivoting sports. Between 30 and 40, it's a little bit more of a choice, but under 30, I almost always will perform an autograft tissue. When we talk about which type of autograft, this largely is surgeon's preference and comfort. Um, about 95% of the time when I do an ACL reconstruction, I use hamstring. I will occasionally use patellar tendon autograft or quadriceps tendon autograft. A quadriceps tendon autograft is a newer procedure for a lot of people in the United States, but has been shown to be very effective, at least in short-term studies. When we look at hamstring versus patellar tendon, uh, outcomes, overall, they are very similar. Neither of them are perfect. The advantages of hamstring in the short term is that it looks more like an ACL and it is easier to match your, your ACL's native anatomy with a hamstring autograft. The incision is also a little bit smaller. And I think the pain for the first week compared to a patellar tendon autograft is a little bit less. In the midterm, the advantage of hamstrings is that I think it, you do not have as much kneeling pain and you do not have as much anterior knee pain. The disadvantage in the near term is that it's a little bit harder to re regain your knee flexion strength, but that usually isn't clinically significant. What that realistically means is if you do your rehab, things like getting out of a squat position or backpedaling or jogging backwards are going to be maybe slightly different at first, but they aren't gonna have long-term problems. The advantage of a patellar tendon autograft is it's probably a little bit faster to heal because you have bone on both sides of the reconstruction. Um, it is very reproducible and it probably leads to slightly less instability when we test on instrumented measures. Meaning if we put a machine that measures how much farther your knee comes forward, it's about a millimeter or two better on average. That's what this study, which was a 17 year follow-up showed. 
Um, importantly, long term, the failure rates or success rates are very similar. There was a recent meta analysis, of, which is a combination of a variety of studies that were put together, and they found that the success rates overall of hamstring was about 97.5%, and patellar tendon was 97.55%. So even though it was statistically uh, significant, the clinical relevance of a 0.05% difference in success rates is really low. So this is a clinical example. This is a 47-year-old patient of mine. He's extremely active. Um, he enjoys hiking. He skis. He gets a season pass annually. He coaches his kids' soccer teams, and he's very active. He tends to demonstrate rather than just stand on the sideline. He says he performs activities that may involve cutting and pivoting up to about five days a week. On physical exam, um, he had a 2B Lachman. The remainder of his ligaments were stable. Um, he did have some medial sided signal in his meniscus, which made us concerned for a medial meniscus tear. And because of his age and his profession, he preferred to proceed with an allograft reconstruction. This is a diagnostic arthroscopy as part of the ACL reconstruction. This is the first part of any surgical procedure that we do after we have harvested the graft. Most of the time we will harvest the graft first, especially after an exam under anesthesia has shown that the ACL is incompetent. We perform a diagnostic arthroscopy to evaluate for any lesions that we thought we saw on MRI or to look and see if there are any changes overall in the knee or any additional injuries since we obtained that initial MRI. So, so far we have looked at the patella and the trochlea where the, um, where the patella sits. This is looking in the notch. To the left is where the ACL tear is. To the right is where the PCL is, but we will get back and see that in a little bit more detail. We next look into the lateral gutter. This is looking down the lateral gutter where we can see the lateral meniscus and the popliteus. We will then look all the way over into the medial gutter. We check the gutters mainly for the meniscus attachments, but also to see if there are any loose bodies or fragments of cartilage that are floating in the knee. So this is the medial gutter here, and then this allows us to drop into the medial compartment of the knee. Um, the meniscus is the flatter white structure that you see. The tibia is below and the femur is above. At this point, usually what I do is I set up my second portal. This is going to be our working portal that allows us to pass instruments in and out of the knee. I use a small needle to make sure I have the right trajectory. This is showing the ACL tear, which is what my needle is pulling off the notch. And then I want to make sure that if we have to do a meniscus repair, that this is going to give me a decent trajectory into the medial compartment. For this patient, I did suspect that he may have a meniscus tear, so I wanted to make sure that that trajectory was going to be appropriate for both things that we think we're going to do at the time of surgery. This is a dilator, which I am using to make sure that that portal is large enough. And then at this point, we are going to introduce a probe so that we can pull the torn ACL off the wall. The ACL should be sitting lower down and it should take up considerably more force with probing. So we now put the knee in a figure of four position, which is the injured knee bent over the contralateral knee. We flush any, any blood out of the knee and we are looking at the lateral meniscus the femur is on the top and the tibia is on the bottom. There is a small partial tear that you can see right about there, but this is less than a centimeter and it does not extend to the top of the meniscus. And because it is right at the popliteal hiatus, I usually elect not to fix these because the natural history studies show that these do fine over time. So this is me just checking to make sure that that tear does not go all the way through to the top and it doesn't. So this is a stable meniscus tear that often we see at the time of ACL injury that we do not need to fix. 
We are then going to go back into the medial compartments and assess that posterior horn meniscus in a little bit more detail. Um, this shows the tibia on the bottom, the femur on the top. And when I get my probe underneath, I can see that meniscus tear I was suspicious of. And you can see that the meniscus comes forward just a little bit more than anticipated. The medial meniscus should only have about three millimeters of excursion at maximum, whereas the lateral meniscus has seven to nine millimeters. So with these small tears, I think they are amenable to an all inside approach, meaning that we don't need to make an incision and pass larger meniscal needles. For the most part, these small tears tend to heal up very well with an all inside approach. Um, larger tears or bucket handle tears or radial type tears, I almost always will do an inside out approach because I think those need um, more sutures in a more rigorous uh, repair configuration. So we clean up those small edges of meniscus, um, which are really cosmetic. Those aren't load-bearing structures. And I pass a small skid. This will allow our meniscus uh, repair device to go in easily inside the knee. So this is uh, the skid. I line this up as close as I can. Then to where the meniscus tear is, the knee is extended and I am pushing with a moderate amount of force in order to open up the back of the knee. This is the meniscus repair device. And I usually, for this type of repair, I am perfectly comfortable doing a horizontal pattern to kind of bridge either side of the meniscus. So that's the first anchor being placed into the meniscus capsule. And then I'm going to go about eight to nine millimeters to encompass the entire length of the tear. Push the second anchor to the other side of the capsule. And then I will pull up on the suture and make sure that that holds. So I pull with moderate force because if it's going to displace, I want it to displace now and not in the future. When I see that flounce or that up down position of the meniscus uh, return, I know that that's a stable repair. With the meniscus cutter, however, I will pull up on the meniscus repair suture a little bit more when I cut the suture. So this is passing the uh, cutting device. I'll pull up on it a little bit more, make sure it's as tight as possible, and then cut the suture. Most outcome studies have shown that the repair type, whether it's all inside or inside out, is not a predictor of whether or not your meniscus will heal. It's more a tear pattern, age of patient, and concomitant injuries. So once we fold that down, that looks pretty good. And I think that is sufficient for this really small type of tear. At this point, we're going to turn our attention to the ACL. Um, I like to put the knee at about 60 degrees hanging off the bed. This allows the knee to be in extension and it gets the fat pad in the front of the knee out of the way. I almost always will start with this three and a half to four millimeter shaver and start by removing the ACL remnant and ligamentum in the front of the knee. To the right is the PCL behind the shaver. And if as long as I keep the shaver blades away from the PCL, then whatever I'm removing is completely and totally safe. With the knee in extension, I find that this is a very reproducible um, means to identify just the ACL and identify the back wall. So that 50, 60 degrees of extension, rather than the hyperflexion that we will actually put the new ACL in, I think is a very reasonable means to um, complete this step efficiently. I also think this allows me to see the stump of the ACL, which is what we are shaving up here. I prefer to remove almost all of this um, in order to not create any blocks of motion in the um, post-operative and recovery period. Most studies that show saving the stump being as a viable option in randomized controlled trials show no difference in outcomes. So I don't think there's really a benefit in saving the stump, even though theoretically it does allow for a little bit quicker cellularization process and maybe slightly quicker neurologic recovery for the ACL. 
So this is a cautery device or essentially a burning device that allows us to remove a little bit more tissue. Um, I usually use this second. Um, this allows me to identify the footprint of the ACL on the tibia. So what I'm looking for is I wanna get this down to a reasonable amount of tissue and really be able to identify that anterior horn of the lateral meniscus, which you can see in the bottom left. Um, this is going to be my landmark for where I'm going to put the tibial tunnel. During this time, I usually have a physician assistant or fellow or resident preparing part of the graft. Um, this allows the case to be efficient. Um, well, I do this part of, of the notch preparation. So this is looking when we are pretty close to being complete. We can see on the right side of the screen, the synovium over the PCL. We can see a empty notch. And the next thing I'm going to do is get set up for my tibial tunnel. So I will put this guide where I want it. Because this is an allograft, we don't yet have an incision. So at this point, outside the frame of view, I am making an incision for the allograft insertion on the tibia. It by no means is it necessary, but for allografts, I will make a small vertical incision. And for hamstring harvest, I will make an oblique incision. That helps remind me in clinic which surgery the patient had, as that will help guide my protocols a little bit in terms of rehabilitation and recovery. So at this point, I bend the knee up a little bit more. I almost always will go back and check that meniscus to make sure that it did not flip into the notch, which in this case, it did not. I am then going to pass a over-the-top guide through the anterior medial portal. This is gonna allow me to reach the back wall. I will usually clean up the back wall a little bit more with this knee and flexion. Right now we're at about 100 degrees. Um, I'm gonna make sure that I can really identify around that back corner well. And you can see now we can really identify that posterior wall in the notch extremely well with the PCL behind our shaver. The six millimeter over the top guide for a nine millimeter graft is gonna give us about a millimeter and a half of back wall. So there's a little um, probe that comes off of that that you can just see going around that back wall there. The guide wire is gonna come through and as we hyperflex the knee, I'm gonna make sure that the lateral meniscus is safe. We are positioned behind the back wall. That way we won't be too anterior with a millimeter posterior wall with this guide pin being drilled through, I feel that this is the best way to reproduce the native anatomy consistently. And to date so far, I think this has been my most successful way of achieving uh, reproducibility with the femoral tunnel. We are next gonna pass a nine millimeter reamer. Um, this we advance by hand until we get into the notch. That way we don't beat up any of the cartilage on the medial femoral condyle. Because we use pretty small incisions, sometimes this is a little bit tricky to pass through the fat pad. This is the um, nine millimeter reamer. We're gonna drill this to a depth of somewhere between 15 and 25 millimeters. We used to go closer to 30, but I think more recent studies and just common sense suggest we don't need that depth for these tunnels. So I think shorter tunnels probably hurt a little bit less and don't have any real downsides. We're then gonna clean up the bone debris so that there is nothing impeding our visualization or impinging in the future. And then we will use a dilating drill to pass our button um, that'll help us with our tibial fixation at the end. So this is just removing the um, bone debris with a shaver. I also will check the back wall at this point and make sure that we haven't breached the back wall. And at this point, you can see we are right up against that back wall with about a millimeter of bone. So I'm pretty happy with this. It's low down on the wall. So I know that this will um, give you good rotational control. 
This is the endo button reamer. So it's just gonna pass through to the lateral cortex. We are then going to pass a string through this guide pin and pull that through. And that'll allow us to pull the sutures for the graft at the conclusion of the case. So those are the sutures going through. We then take the knee into a little bit more extension. I usually like to be at about 70 to 80 degrees for evaluating and placing the femoral tunnel. So then we put the guide right at the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus in the old ACL footprint. So that's me pointing out the lateral meniscus and the ACL footprint. I tend to set this guide to 55 degrees. This gives us at least a 35 millimeter length of the tibial tunnel. 55 degrees was chosen rather arbitrarily because when I started doing these on my own, Tim Lincecum was the pitcher for the Giants and his number was 55. That being said, I think it's pretty consistent and it allows me to give some baseball history at the, at the time of ACL surgery to the residents and um, staff. So that's the guide pin that comes through. I will, we will then use a nine millimeter drill from outside in. Some people are performing this with an inside out reamer, which I think is totally appropriate. Um, I still prefer going outside in as I think it makes it a little bit more consistent in my hands. Once that drill comes through, we will use a shaver to clean up any additional pieces of the ACL stump. So that's the shaver coming through the tibial tunnel. We will then harvest those sutures and that'll allow us to pass the graft. So that is a grasper to pull the sutures through. I then change the position of the camera and put it through the intermedial portal because I like to confirm that we have a back wall. So that is the ACL tunnel on the femur. We can see about a millimeter of back wall. So that makes me really happy. And we see a bigger nine millimeter hole and then a smaller four and a half millimeter hole in the inside of the tunnel for the button to pass and then get stuck on the lateral side. So these are the sutures coming up. This is sometimes the hardest part of the case, getting all these sutures unfurled and um, the button passed. Um, what I like to do is I like to keep the knee at about 80 degrees and I keep pretty firm control of the graft in one hand and the camera in the other. Obviously, I'm doing a better job of controlling the graft than the camera for this case. And once we get all the sutures passed, so you'll see the rest of the sutures go up, we can then slowly advance that button. And that button will catch on the lateral cortex or the outside, right on the other side of that hole, and it is strong enough to withstand forces um, as the ACL is pulled up and as the ACL heals. So we see that button disappear through the big hole, then it is going through the smaller hole right here. And this, I, I am very careful to slowly advance it right to there and where it pops through. You can then pull up on those sutures and make sure it dances or bounces back and forth. We can then use the finger trap that is designed with these buttons now to pull the graft up so that white suture that is being pulled up advances the graft into the socket. So we have the graft coming up right there. We can see the graft kind of going right by our uh, visualization there. And we can see the new ACL fixed into position. We then cycle the knee, so take the knee through a range of motion a few times. Um, I usually do about five to seven cycles. And then I check to make sure that it crosses low down on the PCL um, and does not impinge when we take the knee into extension. And I wanna confirm that the tunnel position shows a nice low oblique ACL here, and then goes exactly where we thought it would adjacent to the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus.
Once we've completed the intraarticular steps, I will then proceed to tibial fixation, which is done without a camera and through that small incision on the front of the tibia. And I usually will use a non-absorbable screw. Surgery for ACL injuries is relatively straightforward, but the rehabilitation takes a considerably longer period of time and I think is overall the most challenging part of an ACL injury. In the immediate, in the immediate post-operative process, you're often going to be protected in your weight bearing for up to about six weeks. So in my practice, and every surgeon is a little bit different, but if you have a meniscus repair, I'm going to protect your weight bearing depending on the type of meniscus tear for up to about six weeks. If you have an isolated ACL injury where we just do an ACL reconstruction, I will let you weight bear as soon as you feel comfortable. And for most, pac most patients, that's around two to three weeks after surgery. After about six weeks, when you've regained your range of motion, you can go walking, you can get on an exercise bike, Around four months is an important milestone because at that point, the graft is healed to bone on both sides. If your physical therapist thinks you are ready, meaning you have enough quadricep strength and your, and your um, balance and coordination is starting to come back, that is when I think it's okay to start running. Between five and six months, you will undergo a physical exam, both by the physical therapist and by your surgeon. At that point, if your quad control is recovered and your strength is approaching normal to the other side, you can start doing cutting and pivoting drills. This will allow you to start thinking about a return to sports around the eight to nine month mark. Between six and nine months, most people are doing conditioning exercises, strengthening a lot of core stability exercises, and starting to think about that return to sport period. At that time, usually the ligamentization process has occurred where new cells have grown down your graft and give the graft enough strength to withstand cutting and pivoting forces. At that point, we usually do a balance and coordination test, and we assess mentally how ready you are to play. There have been some really interesting studies that have come out that show your score on an AC, ACL stability index um, correlates with whether or not you are going to re-injure the knee. So most of the time, I will, I will ask patients how comfortable they are in returning to sport, in addition to feeling the graft, looking for other markers of potential instability, and assessing their balance and coordination. Now, even though we say patients can return into sport by at about nine months, it takes another probably year to year and a half to really return to your highest performance level. And that's because you haven't been doing those sports for a while. There are some psychological components in performing the previous activities. Um, and during that time, it's important that the nerves and blood supply for the graft start coming in. So your balance and your proprioception are important to, to recover during that time. Finally, what's on the horizon? Um, I think in some instances, we will be able to do an ACL repair, especially for younger patients with the right indications. Right now, the short and midterm outcomes from the Bear trial out of Boston suggest that ACL repair may be appropriate for certain patients, but we're awaiting the, long, the midterm and longer term outcomes for these studies. I think it's also important that some of these patients that we have do not function great after their first ACL reconstruction. And part of that is that they may still have some rotational instability. The stability trial, which is a randomized control trial looking at extra articular or things outside the joint we can add to ACLs um, when you have an ACL reconstruction, um, may help us decide when some patients need additional augmentation to make sure that second ACL injury doesn't happen. A third thing that I think will be very important in the next five to 10 years is figuring out how we can biologically support the cartilage injuries that happen even though most of the time we don't have to do anything to the cartilage at the time of ACL reconstruction, we do know that the ACL injury is a semi-catastrophic catastrophic event for your cartilage. It is something that changes the long-term outcome of your knee and does increase the risk of developing osteoarthritis over the course of your lifespan. Therefore, having something that we can inject or give as a pharmacologic agent at the time of injury or at the time of reconstruction, hopefully will delay that progression um, better than we can now.
And finally, I think looking at our physical therapy and rehabilitation, as well as injury prevention protocols in the next five years is critically important. We know that youth athletes have a 30% re-injury rate, 15% on the injured side and 15% on the contra contralateral side. And often we think that is due to incorrect or in uh, ineffective rehabilitation after an ACL reconstruction. We also know that prevention programs, so pro programs done before you even have an ACL injury can reduce risk by about 50%, but most of the time they aren't used. So that's important for athletic trainer, coach, and parent um, education. So they understand the importance of these preseason and early season injury prevention programs. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at my email, and this is my uh, office number.